This is Stanford Engineering's Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Dusty Schroeder tells us about how radar technology is being used to map the insides of ice sheets, such as all of Antarctica and the North Pole and Greenland. Ice allows radio waves to pass through relatively easily, and so we can use it to get detailed information about the structure of ice and how it melts, even for ice that's thousands of meters thick. Amazingly, the same technology can be used to study ice on planets and their moons in our solar system. It's the future of ice penetrating radar. So Dusty, you're an expert at ice penetrating radar, among other things. Um, how does it work and how might it differ from the kind of radar people usually think of when they think about air traffic control and things like that? Yeah, so uh, ice penetrating radar is facing downward. And so the pulses are emitted, they go down through, in many cases, kilometers of ice and are measuring how thick the ice is bouncing off the bottom of the ice sheet. I mean, this is how we know how thick Antarctica is and what the continent looks like underneath it. Other radars are in a more imaging configuration, so they're making sort of pictures, not slices of a cake. Gotcha. So is it the same? Uh, do you have to pick special radio wavelengths in order to get through to the ice? And, and also, what are the other kind of technical challenges of going through, as you said, kilometers of hard water? Yeah, so, so ice is a really cooperative medium. Uh, my dad was an appliance repairman, so we would often microwave water when I went with him and, and fixed people's microwaves. And the way your microwave works is it, it, it heats water. That's how it you know cooks, cooks your food. It, yes. it rotates the water molecules. Uh, when, when it's frozen, that can't happen. And so if you were to put ice cube in your microwave, it's not going to melt from the microwaves, even though it would boil your water. So, so that same feature... I did not know that. That's, that's a showstopper. If I put, because everybody listening to this is now going to go to there. Uh, so you put an ice cube, only the water that's melted will heat up, but the ice yeah. cube itself, I, yeah. maybe everybody else knew that, but that, that's the price of admission right there. P please continue. Yeah, no, so, so, so that same property uh, that the, the water molecules are frozen and cannot rotate uh, causes it not to absorb energy, causes that energy to propagate through the ice sheet gotcha. and reflect off the bottom. But then that same contrast that then lets it boil water and very effectively absorb that energy means that what the waves are experiencing are way different between frozen ice and then when it melts. And yes. so if you're trying to understand ice sheets, a lot of the game is trying to separate frozen water from liquid water. Is water in the ice sheet? Is the ocean going underneath it? Is it melted on the bottom? Is there a lake on the bottom? And that contrast makes nice, bright reflectors that are sort of how we do our business. Awesome. Okay, so that that's a very help. That's very helpful, and uh, and I can imagine now that if you have a big th sheet of ice that happens to have melted water, like a little pocket of melted water, that's going to create a signal that you and your team have to kind of figure out what's going on. Especially if the ice then starts up again and goes another kilometer before it hits the bottom of the the top of the ocean. Uh, is that true that you sometimes hit these little pockets of water? Yeah. So I mean, this is one of the the, the things we've studied recently. Uh, so Antarctica and Greenland are pretty different in what they're experiencing. Antarctica is mostly warm ocean water getting underneath the bottom and melting it from below. Greenland in the summers has these beautiful blue melt ponds on the surface that are like lakes that then drain through the ice sheet and uh, all at once, you know, like, like flushing a toilet and yeah. lubricates the bottom of the ice sheet. Um, and so one of the things we're studying right now is sort of does that water go all the way to the bottom as we thought it did, or does some of it get trapped inside the ice sheet and for how long? And so if you're shooting that radar through the ice sheet and it hits some water, some will reflect back and some it will absorb. Uh, and, that, and you can use that reflection plus absorption to try and quantify like how much water is in the ice sheet, how much is it holding on to, and how much is it getting to the bottom and lubricating its flow. Great. So I definitely want to go to these applications in a minute. And so, but before that, just a couple more kind of setup questions. And the first thing is, um, what has changed in the last, say, 10 years that gets you so excited about this field? Because I know that the general idea of, of, of radar through ice has been around for decades. I think you've written review articles about the last 50 years of, of uh, discovery. But, but I get the sense that things have changed recently that make you very excited about the opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think that's right. A lot, a lot has changed technologically recently. Some of it is on the acquisition side. So uh, it used to be that you would build uh, really custom digitizers and really custom electronics, and it would take a, 
a whole lab of people to build one of these radars. Um, now I have undergrads who, who develop a simple version of it in sort of a year. And part of that is just software-defined radios and progress in electronics, things people are using to make self-driving cars or other you know, sort of radio communications. We can prototype that quickly. So on the instrument side, that's a huge advance. On the platform side, uh, we've got drones, uh, especially longer duration drones that are really becoming right. viable now. That uh, previously, you would have to mount these things onto an airplane. The main airplane we used to collect the data I did my PhD thesis on was a, a DC-3 airplane that fought in the Battle of the Bulge uh, <laughs> and then was re-outfitted for Antarctic surveying. And it's good. That's a robust airplane that can survive a lot in extreme environments. Uh, but getting access to a, a crewed airplane like that is way different than a drone. Uh, finally, our capacity to use really data-rich observations is changing. Um, you know, methods we have to either be radically empirical, like machine learning approaches, or just use vast amounts of data, the field also has developed advances in modeling and our understanding to move us into sort of a monitoring data rich right. regime right. where it's worth collecting richer data. Because so you know how to that, analyze it now and you have the kind of computational horsepower. Y yes, that's right. We know how to analyze it. We are also advancing. I mean, it's a young field, glaciology compared to others. We're still, I mean, one of the things that's amazing about glaciology is uh, you have areas of high societal relevance, like one of my colleagues works on soil moisture, super societally relevant, not a huge number of soil moisture related discoveries right. happening. Right. Right. Then you have like planetary science, which I work in, tons of discoveries, but pretty distant from you know, humanity. Glaciology is, is one of the things ama that's amazing about glaciology is it, it is in a discovery period like planetary science and it is massive societal relevance. And so because of that, it means we're also discovering totally new things. And so even those discoveries, not just the models, not just the horsepower, our fundamental understanding of how ice sheets work are advancing and that puts us in a position to use richer observations. Great. Okay, so thank you. You've been very patient with me setting things up, and so we understand the technology, what's changed. Let's go to the applications for and initially on Earth, because um, I know you've mentioned planetary science, and everybody wants to get there, but let me just ask. So when people think about glaciers, they think about melting, they think about climate change. I presume that this is one of the major uh, research areas that you guys are looking at. So can you tell me what are we learning and what are the questions we're asking that are relevant to climate change, the melting, the melting of the glaciers, and how are, are your measurements and, and your models uh, helping that conversation? Yeah, so in a variety, I mean, ice penetrating radar informs ice sheet models, which inform projections of future sea level rise. It's a fundamental input. Right. So at like the most basic level, uh, radar is how we have maps of what the continent looks like underneath the ice sheet. And if you want to run a model of the ice sheet evolving, you need to put it on top of some topography. Right. And, and we provide that topography. That's still, even that is an area where we're as a community still working and still filling in the map. Because even over these 50 years of collecting the data, there's different nations that have bases and fuel depots in different spots. You start to fill in those lines. Uh, that lets you resolve the topography, hopefully at the scale you need, but it's a whole continent. And so filling in those lines is expensive and difficult, and just the topography is important. But once you start to get a more dynamic understanding of how, for example, say in Greenland, if you have an extremely warm melt summer, and you want to say, how much does that extreme melt summer, where you just have more water, right. affect the ice sheet, affect sea level? Now you, that was not enough to have measured it once. Right. You need to be monitoring it, see how that change has happened, once that goes in to those models, the hope is, and the project we as glaciologists are involved in, observationalists like me, modelers, is to try and get numbers you can count on going forward for how much sea level will rise. What's difficult with ice sheets is there's ways they change that are sort of uh, slow and melty, again, like an ice cube out on a surface. But we also know from the geologic past that ice sheets can go away in a, in a rapid positive feedback collapse. Ah. And those produce much higher numbers. And we can't rule out that happening. And there are areas where that seems like it could be happening now. And so what, what that means then is when you do these projections and like when you have like IPCC uh, climate reports, you tend what, to get what a What is IPCC? So the IPCC is the International Panel on Climate Change. Okay. Uh, and that 
report, which is a consensus document that gets produced every few years of sort of the state of climate science, uh, and it faces policymakers. When you talk about ice sheet contributions to sea level, it's often a bimodal distribution where you get one range of uncertainties, sort of if these collapse mechanisms don't happen, uh. and that gives you certain numbers, you get other much bigger numbers if these collapse mechanisms do happen, and you have even bigger numbers if we say sort of what has Earth done in the past. And so that project of sort of wherever we fall within these numbers, getting good numbers you can plan around that you can then make thoughtful decisions about where to put levees or where to retreat cities or where to uh, what to prioritize, that becomes possible. But right now, those inputs are so spread apart, making rational decisions for, for managers is hard. And so that's the project we're contributing Great. to. Great. So you mentioned the topology uh, like of the, of the ice. And I guess a really naive question I'd love to ask is, when we think about the bottom of a glacier, should we think about a smooth, glassy marble surface? Or is it very like lumpy, bumpy, like a kind of an inverse of the Grand Canyon? How should we think about what these glaciers look like at the bottom? It's all of the above. I mean, Antarctica <laughs> is uh, similar in scale to the United States. If you imagine dumping right. <laughs> kilometers of ice over the whole United States, there are muddy places, there are mountainous places, there are canyons. Um, and you can imagine that the way, say, water flows beneath the ice sheet and lubricates it would be way different if there's a canyon, if there's mud. There's areas where actually the way the ice sheet flows uh, is from sliding on top of water yes. and rocky bed, there's areas where actually a muddy, wet sediment deforms with the ice, and that's how it uh, flows. Uh, there's areas where you know you can have a single mountain or mountain range sort of stabilize the ice, right? Uh, and so you can imagine now if, if you have like a, a mountain sticking up from the bottom, and that can stabilize it. How how many lines do you need to draw in order to capture that to make sure you didn't miss it? Right. In this thing you're putting right because you have a rough model. idea how the mountain is so that tells you how much you have to sample to make sure you don't miss so you don't miss a mountain which might be critical for your model and where we are now we're totally in missing mountain range okay. in terms of the density of data okay so that, this is fantastic the other thing that i gather from looking at your work is that we shouldn't think of these and you've already uh, kind of in, uh, implied this these are li living i don't want to use the word living but they're constantly remodeling and, and ice is forming and unforming and it's a very dynamic process can you give us a feel for that like what's the magnitude is it two percent of the glacier gets bigger or smaller or is it a much larger uh, fraction of a glacier that would remodel, turn to water, then turn back to ice. How should we think about all that? Yeah, so I, I think this, the scales of glaciers, like glaciers and mountains you might visit versus ice sheets like Greenland and Antarctica, yeah. they're, they're each sort of different in their answer to this. So the glaciers themselves that are in, in mountains tend to tend to melt, okay. <laughs> uh, especially now right. in the current climate regime. So, so, so they're, they're melting. Um, and... Uh, depending on the numbers, the amount of sea level you're interested in, uh, you could just say, okay, when they all melt, what's that contribution? That gives you a maximum right. number there. Then you have on the, the next step up is maybe Greenland, where uh, it's more sensitive to the climate. You have melt on the surface. It changes a lot. The processes that govern it um, also are not super intuitive about the, the, the nature of their impact. So you get a big melt. Uh, and all that water goes to the bottom, yes. okay, that's going to lubricate it. Uh, you get melt and it gets trapped in the middle. You say, okay, maybe that's holding the water in. Maybe it's not losing water as much. It gets in there and it refreezes. Well, now that it's frozen, there's a layer of ice. So next year when the water goes in, maybe it can't flow through that layer uh, of ice. So maybe it runs off uh, and maybe that's more. And so you can see there are these feedback processes that uh, are that vary on sort of the seasonal, or even if you want to capture those drainage events daily scale, that then go up to years, centuries, you know, geologic time scales. Antarctica, by contrast, is at the moment not experiencing much melt on the surface. Its, its change tends to be driven by the circulation of warm ocean water. That warm ocean water already was warm. Antarctica is in this case where there's cold water on top of warm water. And so a lot of what governs that change is where does that warm water that's that's beneath flow, does it get access underneath the ice sheet and drive change there? And so each of these change on different scales, but in an ideal world, if we were to monitor 
and understand these systems well, they are changing on this sort of daily to monthly to annual to decadal scales, and we are not monitoring them yeah, in that way. That's really helpful to see that uh, there's these myriad of interacting phenomenon that can make it a highly, I guess, nonlinear prediction task if you're trying to predict. I, I wanted to end at least this segment of our conversation asking about other sources of data. So you're, you're a radar guy, but I know that there's satellite imagery. There's probably, I don't know, there's probably other things. And I would guess that people are thinking about ways to kind of merge the data to get a more complete. So can you talk a little bit about the, the most valuable and complementary data sources that you're excited about bringing in together with your measurements? Yeah, so, so uh, I think you're right. The, the satellite data is very rich and, and, it, and has driven a ton of change and advance in our field. And so anything you can see at the surface, so for example, a diff there's a di totally different type of radar that uh, measures surface velocities. And so you can get these big, beautiful maps of how the ice sheet is yeah. flowing. And that, th when those started coming out, that totally changed the field to get this picture of really how they're flowing and changing. Similarly, altimetry, you can measure the surface, see how much sure. is lowering. These measurements together give you an image of the surface. And so if you... If you think about that, you have, uh, if you think of ice as like, uh, I mean, in some ways you can think about it as a flowing fluid, like maybe honey on, on a table, you know, flowing out. So basically where we are from satellites is we can see the surface of that. And so anything that is an expression of the surface, you're good, you have that from satellites. What's challenging is the physics of what's happening at the bottom, how it's sliding, right. the physics of how the ice itself is deforming uh, those things are not captured by the surface, and they get smoothed out by the time right, you see them right. at the surface. And so, insofar as these processes can really drive change and govern the fundamental physics of how the ice flows, then the surface measurements are inadequate on their own. But our measurements and the things we try to do are always interpreted in the context of those measurements, and in many ways we're trying to add a third dimension to that two-dimensional picture that we currently have as a field. This is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman, and we'll have more with Professor Dusty Schroeder next on The Future of Everything. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Dusty Schroeder of Stanford University. In the last segment, Dusty described how ice penetrating radar works and how we are using it to understand ice on Earth and how the liquid and solid water at the poles behave under a variety of conditions. In this next segment, Dusty will tell us how the same technology can be used to study water and ice in outer space. There is work looking at the moons of Jupiter, a potential lake in Mars, and also some observations about our own moon. Uh, you also have an interest in space, the moon, the moons of other planets, the other planets themselves. How does that translate? How, how can we use this same technology to study these uh, planetary phenomena? Yeah, so uh, our group is focused on shooting radar through ice. And we'll do it anywhere in the solar system that gives us ice and where society is willing to put a radar. Uh, we, my first, uh, so our first involvement in planetary science missions came through the Europa Clipper mission, which is going to Europa, the icy moon of Jupiter, which has more water than Earth. Wow. Uh, it has a ice shell around a global ocean. And one of the tools we have to probe into that ice shell and understand how the shell works is ice penetrating radar. So in my experience as a group uh, and a scientist and engineer who focuses on this technology, it was natural to get involved in that mission. Uh, and a lot of the analysis techniques we use on Earth are applicable there. Now, a big challenge in the planetary setting is power. So the systems, the, the systems we've used on Earth up until now tend to be sort of one kilowatt transmitters flying about 100 meters okay. above the surface. In a planetary setting, we're using like 10 volt oh. transmitters, hundreds of kilometers above the surface, and so, uh, or at least tens of kilometers above the surface. So it's a much more challenging power budget yeah. situation, but like we talked about earlier, uh, the colder the water is, the more ice uh, radar pens tends, the colder the water is, the more radar tends to penetrate the ice, and space is very cold. So, so that so helps our, you. Our main, it helps. It's, it's, it's the, the main so, reason. So I'm glad you went right to this issue of the distance from the surface, because I, I was wondering before our chat whether or not you can make measurements from Earth. That sounds like it's out of the question. It, it is. If you imagine uh, 
a, a transmitter sort of propagating, the energy spreads out. And the further you go, you lose energy, like sort of one over R squared going out and one over R squared going back. So you, so you lose energy a lot. So you really have to go there if you want to penetrate. And, and if you had your druthers, you would tell them to fly these probes as close as possible with, without crashing. You might even take a crash if you got your data in time. So that's actually a, a nuanced and complicated question. You can imagine um, maybe if you were trying to take uh, a video from a uh, from a car that you'd want to be close so you could get good resolution, but there's a point you'd be so close yeah. that it would blur. That's too close. Gotcha. We have the same problem. Okay, so what are the questions? So you're not, I, 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 I don't know. Are you worried about global warming on other planets? Or what are the scientific questions that make these measurements uh, relevant? So I think the top level question for the planetary cryospheric science community tends to be habitability. Uh -huh. Certainly Europa Clipper is dedicated to that. Uh, so it's trying to understand whether the moon of Jupiter is habitable. And a lot of that has to do with, okay, you know, there's water in this global ocean. We tend, life yeah. tends to like water here on earth. Uh, you have this ice shell between it and the surface. Uh, you'd like to get other chemicals in contact with the chemicals from the ocean to give life uh, some, yes. something to work with chemically. Uh, and so a lot of the challenge there is understanding uh, where in the ice shell you could have pockets of liquid water. Um, in the context of, of Mars, there's uh, radar reflections, which suggest there may be a lake underneath the South Pole or Holy ice cap cow. of Mars. Uh, and that is interesting from a both a habitability and a history of the planet point of view. And this is this is one of this may be the coolest analysis of ice penetrating radar will ever be because there's a big debate right now about whether this is a lake under that ice cap on Mars. And all of that argument comes down to images where you have a reflection from the surface of the ice cap and a reflection from the bottom. And the bottom reflection is stronger than the top one. Therefore, giant arguments, wow. lake or not. And, and I think that is a tangible way to understand why it is such a rich and and a consequential thing to really nerd out about reflections from radar. And I would ice. guess that um, there's a lot of, well, we saw this on Earth and this looks a little bit similar. So a lot of an analogical reasoning to the kinds of multiple observations you've made on Earth. And then how do we apply this to these, I'm going to guess, very noisy image, images from these other pl from these other planets and their moons? Yeah, so, so there's rich analog research, but there's also um, there's also the temperatures are way different and and the processes are different when you're using different time scales and temperatures so there's also a place in the debate where where some people you know re like us are, are really looking at the the data there's other people who are just trying to freeze ice with the right chemistry uh cold enough and slow enough obviously we can't wait thousands or millions of years for our tests but they're thoughtful lab scientists trying to argue how will these electrical properties of ice and water behave huh. at these temperatures with these chemistries? Can that explain? Now, I have to ask, when you say habitability, I, there's two potential interpretations. One is, will it be useful for us humans to set up a camp there in the next you know, couple thousand years? And there's also, is it possible that there's already life there for what? Which one do you mean or is it both? I, I, I mean the second. I think that the, the challenge there, especially in the case of Europe, I think there are other attractive <laughs> places uh, for, for us if, if, if we were so inclined. But uh, the, the question is, is, is there life outside of Earth in the solar system is really, is really the motivating project. Gotcha. And so, okay, so um, I, I just want to make sure, because in, in looking at your, your work, I see that you've, you've mentioned the moon, which I don't think of as a very watery place. What's the situation with water on the moon? With water on the moon, it's much more people... Okay, so that, that's more connected to your, okay. to your other point about, you know, human, human utilization of that. And there's really questions about uh, there, there's evidence of ice in craters and below the surface. How much water ice is there around on the moon that could be utilized by people? And so that, that, that falls a little, uh, is the moon analysis is more in sort of mapping ice for potential utilization than, say, Mars in Europa, where the question is much more about the rise of life. Gotcha, gotcha. Of so we, we've touched a little bit on Europa, and I think you mentioned Mars and the lake, the, the question about the lake, very exciting. And the other one I saw you mention was Mercury. I, is there anything to say about Mercury that we should all know? Uh, okay. I don't think so. I think my, my involvement in Mercury is more, uh, I was advising a postdoc who was working on it, and he drug me kicking and screaming into a Okay, good, target. good, okay. <laughs> uh, so in the last minute or so, I wanted to ask you about the future outlook, and you've also written about the great opportunity uh, in this field right now uh, go, going forward. So tell me about your enthusiasm about this. 
Yeah, I, I think there, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that's exciting about the field is this combination of societal relevance and discovery. I think the other thing which is really satisfying about particularly ice penetrating radar is it is a space where you can still be the sort of scientist who makes these discoveries, who interprets the data, and who invents their wow. own instruments. And this this is like, I, I find that a very romantic image of yes. science from 100, 150 years ago. In most modern big science, that's not available. But through a series of sort of technological advances and the fact that the frequencies and geometries and character of the systems we're making uh, are not commercially applicable, don't have direct commercial applications in the way that, say, my colleagues who right. use seismic data or who use radars that are used in defense. We're sort of in a niche there where uh, my students, undergrads, grad students, we're even working with a, a like a, this high school student I email back and forth with, you know, they are inventing systems that once they're tested really become the state of the art in the field for certain types of measurements. And I think that's like a really exciting and satisfying uh, yes. spot to and, be And it raises a, the idea, a, of the very romantic, I agree, romantic is the right word, idea of these citizen scientists who's making, uh, and in biology, we were, we were seeing this in the 19th century, and it has become very hard, not impossible, but very hard in biology to do the same thing. Well, thanks to Dusty Schroeder, that was the future of ice-penetrating radar. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman.